Politics has been an interesting piece of our lives in the recent years. And of course, in an election year, it plays almost an outsized role in our culture. And we're seeing some new things happening this year, things that we haven't seen before, such as the rise of conservatives from quarters that are unlikely. People who are avowed secularists, atheists, but they're championing causes that have traditionally been those of the uh, moral majority of the 80s or other folks who had been aligned or associated at least with the church. What are we to make of all of this? How do we understand the new secular conservative movement? How does it differ from, say, the traditional conservative movement or classically libertarian beliefs? And uh, is this a good thing for us or is this something that we need to uh, be wary of? That's what we're going to talk about on this Come Let Us Reason Together. Well, welcome again, everyone. I'm Lenny Esposito uh, with Come Reason Ministries, here to talk about something that, again, is grabbing a lot of headlines today, maybe not in the way that you would think about it. There has been, in the uh, traditional kind of milieu of the political process, usually understood two parties, right? There's the uh, Democrats and the Republicans, and these have had a specific makeup and been kind of identifiable over the years. But that's changed recently as uh, party preferences and, and really values have shifted. And what I'd like to do is to discuss this with a, a friend of mine, a fellow colleague, uh, Dr. Darren Guerrera. And uh, Dr. Uh, Guerrera is an associate professor of political science at Biola University in La Mirada. He uh, focuses specifically on American politics, constitutional law, and public policy. Now, uh, Darren's put out a book, Perfecting the Constitution, the Case for Article 5 Amendment Process. And uh, he has earned his doctorate from Claremont Graduate University, taught at Vanguard in Southern California, as well as uh, served in the California State Government as a member of the Student Aid Commission and Post-Secondary Education Commission. So, Darren, you've talked about this uh, Quite a bit. You've you've been around. You understand the the issues. Oh, and Darren is also a colleague of mine at the Kirkwood Center for Theology and Ethics, where we get together and discuss issues of faith, religion, politics, and how all those things kind of come together. So, first of all, welcome to the program. Glad to glad to have you on. We've talked quite a bit, but you've never been a guest before. So, thanks for having me. Lynn. Yeah, Glad yeah. Here. And and this is kind of an exciting. Um, time. I, I must say that, you know, I, I've been through several elections, many elections, but nothing like I've seen this year. This is a yeah. first in many, many ways. From the fact that we have the first time in, what, a century that you have a, a real good chance of a past president becoming a, a future president with a gap in between them, yeah, as well as... Cleveland. Yeah, since Grover Cleveland, that's right, as well as all of the crazy stuff that has been following assassination attempts and and and, and a real a polarization that many folks have said they haven't seen in the country since, say, before the Civil War days. So, first of all, uh, what is your take on on kind of the, the political structure today and, and what we're seeing? Well, um yeah, I mean, uh, very interesting times. I think um, I would just say big picture. Um, I, I think we have, I, I don't want us to go overboard in terms of how divisive things are. Um, I think we've, I mean, you already mentioned the Civil War was way more divisive than than we have now. <clears throat> yeah, we're, we're not all taking up arms against each other as yet. <laughs> not yet, right. Um, and there's been very divisive times, even in the 20th century, and so I don't want to overstate that. But that being said, um, some of this is unprecedented in terms of, you know, we just in terms of the the social uh, science data we have on attitudes and behaviors. Um, you know, the United States is not as behaviorably or um, belief wise in terms of how you measure that with social science measurements is not as Christian as it used to be. And so that's going to have an impact on politics. I mean, 
It just does. I mean, you don't even, not even from a Christian standpoint. I mean, you can go back to the ancient Greeks, you know, they would just say, look, the, um, the culture is based on the cult or your theological beliefs. And as that culture shifts, it's going to change beliefs and behaviors. And, and in the U.S., um, you know, things have shifted. Um, I think people debate how irreparably or not. Um, I tend to be in the camp that things can be repaired, but it's something to, to keep an eye on. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's definitely a no longer a um, Christian nation in terms of ethos uh, in, in that regard. And, and that makes a difference in a lot of ways because uh, one of the things that, of course, we would do, argue, uh, even for God's existence, is the idea of moral grounding, that our morals have to be grounded in some kind of principle. Traditionally, right. that has been religious belief. So now that we don't, it's not assumed that that there is a God and an understanding, at least there's not a clearly well-defined religious um, theos there. Uh, you know, yeah. it, there, there, there seems to be some po folks will have an ambiguity about what God is, but it's but it's kind of this salad bar theology well, yes. where it's really tough to ground uh, a, a moral value system because it seems to be, you know, a pick and choose. So uh, because there is a, 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 a kind of an ephemeris moral system out there how do we understand that then in the traditional sense of you know kind of conservative versus uh progressive right in the 70s you could identify democrats by certain uh specific programs and and desires usually they were for the little man usually they were for um you know equality at all costs uh liberty they were very strong on um freedom of speech and things like that. And, and Republicans, of course, were very strong on conservative values, uh, very much church type values. But today that's that's different. What do you, what do you see as the differences? Yeah, no, I, I mean, just to go back to underscore something you just said is if you think of kind of like a pyramid and at the base of the pyramid, everyone has a metaphysical, to, sorry to use a philosophical word, but a metaphysical basis for everything, which is metaphysics is just a fancy word for the nature of reality. What is really real? And uh, on top of that, you have epistemology, which is how do we know stuff, right? And on top of that, you have ethics. Well, what do we do? How do we live our lives in light of what is real and what we know? How, how do we live our lives? And on top of ethics is politics. How do we live our lives together? And so <clears throat> kind of what you're describing is a system where um, in the modern era, they started the skepticism about what's really real, and they thought it was just materialism. And now we're in this kind of postmodern era where they don't, they don't know if, we, if there's anything that's real, right? And you see evidence that we don't know what women are. We don't know what this is or that is. We don't know. Um, and then epistemology, how do we, we don't, our knowledge, we have questions about knowledge. And so this pyramid, these two fundamental bottom rungs of the pyramid are for many people just gone, Right. And so then your ethics, which should be building off of your this reality and what we know about reality, those two rungs are not there. So ethics is just a free-for-all. And then, of course, above that, politics, that's really a free-for-all because we don't even have a shared basis for ethics. I mean, you go back 50 years, maybe the 1960s was the last era where, you know, early 60s, where Amer most Americans, those they knew what was real. They knew how we knew it. Then they had disputes over maybe how to live or how how not, uh, or um, or maybe those first two rungs were a little sketchy and people debated them. But for the most part, instinctively they knew that there was a God and that we could know that. And you had your atheists doubting that, but most people, by and large, just took that for granted. That's just not taken for granted anymore. And so that has shaped our ethics and certainly shaping our politics. And so. There's really no deeper basis for agreement on these things. And um, Christianity used to provide the boundaries of agreement, the rules of the game. And um, so people have kind of um, rejected that, not even knowingly. I mean, they reject Christianity on some surfacey level sometimes, but they've also rejected those 
what is real and what we know about being real. They rejected that as well, maybe not even thinking about it. And that has dire ramifications for society and therefore for our politics. Yeah, I'm reminded of uh, the book that Charles Murray put out, which was uh, called Coming Apart. I don't know if you've, yeah. uh, you've read. So he, he uh -huh. uses two classes. He, he starts with America 1916. He uses yeah. two towns in Pennsylvania as kind of stand-ins for, for society. There was, I think it was Brighton and Fishtown. Now, these are both yes. real yeah. towns. One's right. blue-collar primarily, and one is uh, upper class, you know, uh, kind of East Coast elitist. Uh, right. prep school culture uh, he said but he would say a couple of things he said that you know mm -hmm. both of them had certain shared values yep. and uh, if you were in middle management for example you would still go to JC Penney and buy your suit off the rack uh, yep. at, while the while the warehouse worker who lived in Fishtown would be the one to buy his jeans in the same store and yep. and you might live on the same block and you would have discussions and you might be of one party registration he'd be of another and you would have this but at the end of the day you were neighbors and you you said hello to each other and you understood these kinds of things and he he points to four or five specific uh, points of divergence that have happened since then, religion being the primary one. Uh, yeah. And then, the, of course, the fall in the uh, the uh, marriage and, uh, and uh, having children out of wedlock. And he points to several other things to show just how divergent these two classes of people have become to where they don't even have the same life experiences anymore. So we're really talking about two different kinds of people. But you're absolutely right. I mean, Kennedy, in, uh, I remember Kennedy in the early 60s, he, he actually ran on a platform where he believed that public servants shouldn't unionize. He didn't believe in public service unions because he at least understood that if you have a public servant who's a union, who is their boss? Who are they? Who's their antithesis that they're arguing against? Well, it's Nobody. It's the politicians yeah. are the ones who pay them, but the politicians are the ones whom they're supporting. So they're actually literally voting in their own bosses, which yeah. means that that the that the union system can't work because there's no uh, mutually, you know, um, detriment to to both sides. Uh, right. it, it's all one sided. So so the, the these are the kinds of things that that are markedly different today. And and again, religion is. I think central to this, although nobody's talking about that in this election cycle, which is really interesting. They're all assuming that Republicans are all Christians, right? I, I mean, yeah. you, you, you see that there's a, and there's this whole moniker of uh, Christian nationalism that's thrown around, which is uh, an interesting epithet because it's usually poorly defined. What, what's your take yeah. on Christian nationalism and how you see it? Yeah, well, Christian nationalism is a term that means what it's a Rorschach test to whoever is using it, right? And it can mean divergently different things. And like, just in, for clear thinking, you have to have well-defined terms. And Christian nationalism is not a well-defined term. And you, you, you talk to one person, and Christian nationalism is horrible, and it means a whole set of things. You talk to another person, oh, it's great, and it means a whole different set of things. But when you have a term that can be used that widely to mean almost total opposites it's essentially meaningless and yet it gets thrown around uh by detractors and proponents all the time and i'm i'm pulling my hair out going what do you what do you mean by this what, what does it mean to you and so i just don't find it a helpful term <clears throat> i reject those that embrace it as a positive that we should embrace it because it means nothing that christianity and nationalism put together that's all it means but you talk to someone else and they think it, no, it means it's a, an authoritarian uh, kind of system. Um, and uh, it's just not a helpful term. And if you chart when it started being used, I think Mark David Hall's done good work on this. He has a new book on Christian nationalism, just came out. Uh, but he charts it. We'll link to that in, like, the, in the comments too. We'll link, we'll link to his book. Yeah, sure. Um, he said, it, 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 it's almost an invention of kind of the left as a, as a buzzword that they could use to um, um, just hang around people who want to make religious arguments in the public square. And uh, making religious, when you have a term that can um, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
delegitimize people from making basic religious arguments about anything, then it's not a helpful term. Or <coughs> it's a malicious term designed to alienate people in, who are good faith um, citizens trying to make good faith arguments. So let me let me ask you something else, because something else is interesting in this cycle. Um, we are living in a time of, of radical social upheaval as well. So, you know, with, with uh, in 2008, for example, Obama ran on a natural family platform. He specifically said that he supports marriage as a one man, and one woman in 2008. Uh, after 2012, <coughs> he kind of pulled that idea. And by 2015, we have the Obergefell decision where that sanctions same-sex marriage. And then before you could even catch your breath, the transgenderism uh, right. uh, issues mm. exploded across the, uh, the the stratosphere. And it and it knocked a whole bunch of people for a loop. Coupled with that, you had, of course, um, radical increases in homeless problems, the fentanyl crisis peaked. You had, um, of mm -hmm. course, the BLM movement in 2020 and, and the anti-police, right? The, the shut down the police folks, plus COVID, which was, a, you know, many people saw that as a government <laughs> overreach. And what happened was there was a lot of folks who had traditionally been proponents of the left and many of them were in uh, media, many podcasters. I'm thinking of folks like Dave Rubin, uh, folks like that, who, um, and well, even um, you, you have Bill Maher and you have uh, um, uh, Mor uh, Pierce Morgan, right? And, and you have all of these guys who, who have seemed to have shifted and said, wow, we really <clears throat> went too far. And now they seem to be championing conservative causes but with a caveat with an asterisk right because they're not moral conservatives they're kind of political conservatives where they would hold some of the moral values but they don't hold that morality may even be um um uh, objective. I mean Dave Rubin for example is in a same sex union and he and his husband, his partner, have a, a child together. Now, we wouldn't say that he's, he's, you know, emulating Christian values. But here we have these people. We have we have James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian, for uh, example. These are two guys who their primary task prior to, say, 2015 is they would go around college campuses and they would have debates with Christians on campus to try and disprove Christianity. They were they were in the, you know, new atheist camp, if you will. But what happened was in the campuses, you had a lot of uh, students protesting and, you know, uh, virtue signaling and, and microaggressions. And they saw that, rightly so, as a greater threat to the society, to the Western experiment than uh, maybe Christianity was. And, and they not only pulled back, they've almost come to Christians and said, you guys got to stand with us as well, because you're the only ones who believe that rationality and reason are worth upholding. So we've got this kind of strange mixture now of traditional conservative Christian types as well as the secular uh, conservatives, I guess you would call it, who are championing uh, the conservative movement, if, if it is a conservative movement. And that's, this is where I'm getting murky on all this, and I need your help, because do we call this a conservative? What is this thing, and what are the dangers? What are the benefits? I mean, you know, both are true, but to, what do you see... Um, with this kind of strange admixture, the strange bedfellows. Yeah, no, that's, those are all, there's a ton of good questions here, and so um, <clears throat> let me go back to that pyramid I was building: the reality, the metaphysics, the epistemology, what we can know, modernity and postmodernity. Like, I see this in my Christian students. Also, they unknowingly kind of jettison those bottom two rungs, and so the ethics. And the politics are strictly cultural. They haven't thought through how do we know things, what is really real. And so in the midst of all this chaos with COVID and everything, I think you've seen a shift. You've seen people who are like, um, 
a lot of the people that uh, Dave Rubin and those people that you were Bogosian, um, Andrew Murray, I guess. Well, he was already conservative, but um, but they're like rationalists. They believe in reason, but they don't believe in faith. And so in the old liberal order, you had the rationalists and the faith people kind of button heads and arguing. Right. Well, <clears throat> other fronts have been opened up. You have people who don't believe in liberalism at all, like. Liberalism being defined, I'll define it as a system that believes in human agency and human freedom, right? And so you had conservatives and you had uh, kind of liberals butting heads. What was opened up is you have kind of post liberals on the left, say like 1619 Project, where they don't necessarily believe reason should govern how we do things. Um, I could unpack that more, but I would assert that and defend that. Uh, but you also have people on the right who say, well, this liberal order where these people were butting heads is, is not helpful, and they do it from a conservative position. And so this general liberal order based on reason um, has been under assault. And so um, that's where um, you see a lot of people who used to consider themselves on the left because they were rejecting kind of a faith, uh, a, a, a politics and an ethics rooted in the traditional Christian faith, they didn't want that traditional piece, but they're starting to see they're being attacked on the the far left by people who don't believe much in anything other than power. And they're like, whoa, they see the implications, that's dangerous. And they don't want a part of that. So they're like, okay, we'll make common cause with these Christians who we still have disagreements with, but at least we uh, secular liberals and Christians believe in civilization, right? That there are standards of behavior, standard, cultural standards, um, uh, where we make reasoned arguments, even if we don't agree, we debate one another, uh, we don't just shout each other down. And so they're seeing the value of that, that old traditional culture, and they see tradition as helping buttress that. Um, <clears throat> And so that's why I think you see some of these people who would have been maybe kind of liberals in the old days kind of saying, hey, we'll make common cause with people we used to, to, to malign, because if we don't, the whole, the whole culture, the whole civilization is going to collapse. It's interesting you, you bring this up because they do value civilization and they do value reason. And of course, that does come out of the Enlightenment period, right? That's that's kind of where it gets its start with Kant and Rousseau and the, these folks. But, well, I would say they they would they think that it they think it starts with the Enlightenment. Thoughtful right. Christians would say no, the Enlightenment actually is downstream of some deeper things that are rooted in faith. But we can we can unpack that more later. But well, yeah. that was that was exactly where I was going. My 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 point is, how can you say civilization is worth saving, rationality mm -hmm. is worth uh, pursuing? if you don't have a, a basis of, say, the idea that man as a rational being is rational because he reflects God's image. So, for example, the, the, the primary argument, you know, that Lewis and others has made from the argument of reason says that, well, if I'm, if my brain is simply a product of evolutionary forces and evolutionary chance, then the only thing that it's doing is trying to make me survive. Whether my beliefs are true or false don't matter. It just matters whether they make me survive. I use I use the example of a, a man um, who maybe lives in a um, society that's very well fed and very you know they, but it's kind of backwards an animistic society and uh, he believes that um, maybe this society has a, a penchant for heart disease, and uh, he believes that uh, you know if he were to run three miles every day. Um, he could ward off the invisible uh, tiger god who chases him down to kill him and strike at his heart, right? The, the, the tiger god chases you down to strike at your heart and you have to run three miles every day in order to escape it. Once you outrun it, then you're safe for another 24 hours or something like that. Now, that, that's a belief that's not necessarily true, but the fact that he's running three miles every day will strengthen his heart. It will help him lose weight and he may actually survive so that the outcome of his belief is survivability, but it's not necessarily truth. So there, so the, 
there are, and Lewis makes the point, when you start to say rationality and reason actually give you a look into a true world, what grounds that if it's not Christianity? Again, Christians would say, we're just thinking God's thoughts after us. So the fact that God exists and he's there means that their world is discernible, means that it's discoverable, it, it's reliable, because God is discoverable and reliable. And, and if you don't have that, I mean, it's nice to say that you believe in rationality, but again, where do you get that from? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Yeah, no, exactly. And that, that's the question, but I think that's the, that's where a lot of these folks, and it'll be interesting to see where these go. Um, uh, you had mentioned um, um, uh, Dave Rubin. Um, Andrew Clavin has a wonderful article, Can We Believe? And it was in the City Journal 2019. And he lists in this phenomenon, and he, he would, there's an Italian philosopher, Marcello Parra, um, who wrote a book, Why We Should Call Ourselves Christian. And Parra realized, he's seeing the same disintegration, right? Um, and he's saying, <clears throat> this is a quote from Parra, without faith in equality, dignity, liberty, and responsibility of all men, that is to say, without religion of man as the son of the image of God, Liberalism cannot defend the fundamental universal rights of human beings or hope that human beings can coexist in a liberal society. Basic human rights must be seen as a gift of God and hence pre-political and non-negotiable. And um, I would throw in there people like Douglas Murray would probably have that position. Jordan Peterson, depending on how you read him. Um, and then... Um, <clears throat> um, uh, what's the uh, the historian uh, Holland? Um, he wrote a book called Dominion. He makes the same point. Like Tom Holland, all yes. of these liberal values that we cherish, uh, free speech, uh, human dignity, all of these things are really rooted in a Christian God. Now, what's interesting, though, Marcelo Pera and Holland um, and a number of these people say, and notice Para, the title of his book, Why We Should Call Ourselves Christians. His conclusion in his book, I haven't read the book, but I read the article uh, that Clayman did. His conclusion is that we need to make those non-negotiables, even though we don't believe it. <clears throat> Same with Paul. So, it's, 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 it, it's very much Michael Roos, right, where, you, where, where um, believing in God is a useful fiction because it helps us to believe in morality, and we know that morality will help us as a, as a society. It, Exactly. That goes to your analogy you were giving earlier. It's like, well, um, Holland says this, Paris says this. Um, I think Murray would say this. That they know that it, they know that our culture, our civilization, as it's built, came to us through <clears throat> the traditions of the West, which were patently Christian. And but they'll they'll say something like, but we know that's not true, but we still need it, right? Um, which is just kind of begging the ultimate questions like, well, if they're not true, then how do you know that all these other things are good, right? Um, but yeah, so there is this phenomenon of basically secular conservatives. I'd say they're conservatives in the sense they want to conserve Western civilization. Okay, that As was a, the good question. What 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 is because if you're a conservative, you're trying to conserve something. Yeah. Uh, so these former liberals. Are like, wait, we want to conserve the modernist liberal order. Um, and we see that now starting to erode. And so we'll ally ourselves with these even more traditional people to fight the, the forces of chaos, basically. And so they're, they're new conservatives in that sense. But they want to have their conservatism. As you said, Dave Rubin, I, I've listened to his stuff. He's, he's a thoughtful guy. Uh, but as you say, he does not live a, a life rooted in Christian um, um, orthodoxy, right? So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so these, these strain of folks are, are saying we should live as if we're Christians or we should embrace Christian um, uh, values in some sense. Um, but it really is kind of a hodgepodge um, pick as you go because they, again, they see the value of it. Um, uh, Tom Holland, now I can remember his first name, Tom Holland. He, he Tom says Holland, that, yeah. He wrote, his whole book is saying how Christianity really built the West. As an objective historian, he's like, I cannot deny this. And I, I, I love all the values that have come from it. But I know that there's no God. And so this Christian myth is just that. It's just uh, uh, a myth. And so he's really in a quandary. 
uh, and people like that. Um, another one who's made the shift, uh, although I don't, you know, uh, Ali Hershey, uh, the former Muslim, yeah, that's turned right. secular atheist, turned, um, I think she does did become a Christian. She she, she was baptized. Yeah, she yeah, she says so that she says now she's Christian. The, uh, she may actually. So I suspect a number of these people the 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 tension will be too strong, and they're going to have to, um, uh, you know, make a make a decision at some point uh, to either embrace the fullness of the Western tradition and its religious roots. Um, um, or maybe they'll just continue to make common cause with people who actually believe this stuff. <laughs> so one of the points uh, that I made in a, a previous podcast where I talked about the nation's founding and I talked about it being uh, we, we weren't a theocracy. We've never the United States has never planned to be a Christian nation in the sense that it is a theocracy. But it did come out of uh, very specific Christian ideals or principles, it, it, and they're specifically Christian. One of those is, of course, that all men are inherently sinful, that they, uh, given um, their run, man will always tend toward evil and toward corruption, so you have to guard against that with like the, the three branches of government with uh, balance of power and things like that. But one of the other points that I made it was the need for a virtuous citizenry. And this was made over and over by the fathers. I'll read you a couple of quotes. John Adams said, quote, and this is, of course, a very famous quote. He said, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by an absence of morality and religion. Avarice, ambition, revenge, or gallantry they would break the strongest cords of our Constitution as a whale that goes through a net. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And then Governor Morris, who is considered the penman of the Constitution, he wrote it, the preamble and kind of took down uh, all the notes and everything through the constitutional process. He writes, quote, for avoiding the extremes of despotism or anarchy, the only ground of hope must be on the morals of the people. And I believe that religion is the only solid base of morals and that morals are the only possible support of free governments. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. So it seems to me that our fathers are saying, right, Benjamin Franklin's famous line uh, when asked what kind of government do we have, he said, a republic if you can keep it. Even, even Franklin, who is no churchgoer, uh, understood that there is a underlying moral function that holds the political together. So, so to be kind of secular and conservative has an inherent tension in it if people are truly sinful and will run toward the evil. So how do we understand that in today's political race? I mean, here we have, in and a lot of people on the left point to us and say, how can you as a Christian vote for someone with the character flaws of say a Donald Trump? And, you know, and to some degree they, they make a valid point because if we are talking about morals being the, the ground and the, and the cement that holds the Republic together, then what do we do with that? So it's, it's a tough question. Yes, no, it is. It is. Um, but let's let's uh, let me take the, the the first one you were raising. Um, <clears throat> first, what do we make of it? Um, uh, Robert George, who's a wonderful scholar at Princeton, he's written a, a number of things, but he has a great article that I assigned to my students. And he he puts it simply. He said, "Look, republics require virtue, and virtue requires religion." And the United States religion is Christianity. It's that simple. Um, and it makes sense, right? If you have a monarchy or an aristocracy, you need a virtuous monarch or a virtuous aristocracy, right? Or you get tyranny or oligarchy, right? So if you can have a republic, the people need to be virtuous, right? How do you have a virtuous people? Well, they believe in standards of conduct. They believe in a morality that's larger than themselves. They didn't make it up, right? And Christianity gives you just that. Now, Christianity is much more than simply morality, although a lot of people forget that. But it does at least that, right? <clears throat> and so 
The founders were very clear. In a republic, you need a virtuous citizenry. In the United States, that was 98% Protestant. You're gonna, it's gonna be Christianity. Um, and and so um, they were very clear that you needed to keep a healthy um, <clears throat> uh, religious uh, devotion within them people, and they need to be um, a moral people. Um, and to be a moral people, they need to be religious, or at least a, a certain high percentage of them, right? I mean, no society on earth this side of uh, Jesus coming back a second time is going to have 100%, you know, uh, Christian people. Um, but the idea was that if you have enough of society that believes in Christianity, or even if they don't believe in Christianity, they act as if they believe in Christianity, or even if they don't do that, at least they behave themselves for the most part, that could work. Right. That could work. Right. Um, right. And so <clears throat> there is an attention to um, 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 keeping religion and churches healthy. Now, the big difference, I need to tell you this and probably a lot of your listeners, America decided one big difference. We are not going to um, <clears throat> require the church to keep an eye over political society and government. Right. England, they had an established church. It was the Anglican Church, and I will unpack all of English history, but they had horrible civil wars because they couldn't agree on which Christian, which form of Christianity should govern England, right? Um, and, of course, we had the, the Catholic Church in, in much of Europe, and you had the religious wars, and so Europe thought you needed a religious authorities, an institutional church, to superintend the political process and that was a disaster in europe and in england and the americans um partly just because of religious diversity right you had um you had puritans in new england and yeah the guys who and, fled from the they were in the minority and they they knew what uh, religious oppression looked like right in the 1640s the puritans fled under anglican persecution and when the puritans under oliver cromwell took control in the 1650s and 60s, the Anglicans fled to America, right? So you have Puritans in, in New England. You have Anglicans in Virginia. You have the Quakers who came into the Delaware Valley in Pennsylvania who were persecuted by both of the other groups, right? And then then you had the, um, the rowdy um, Presbyterians and Baptists from, like, the northern border sections of England and Scotland and Northern Ireland start immigrating over, and the Quakers are like, these people are uncouth and they're rowdy. Let's push them into the interior. And so in Appalachia and all, all down the spine of the Appalachian mountain range, you have all these Baptists and Presbyterians. None of these people got along with each other in England. But in America, if they're going to make common cause against a king, they're going to have to find some basis to make common cause that doesn't you know, bring up all these old religious um, biases and and guess what? They were able to make common cause despite their religious differences. Um, and and so, anyways, so in America you have a separate. We're like, okay, there's no, there's going to be no institutional church dominating government, but that doesn't mean that we don't need religious belief and religious practice. And so we're going to, uh, I know for some Christians we're going to separate church and state. Now, to be very clear, we're separating the institutions of church and state. But that's not a separation of religion and politics. That's a different thing. Religion is necessarily going to inform your politics, right? Uh, religion... Yeah, it has to. Yeah, it shapes your your moral thought. It shapes your, your thought about what's real, how we know things, those fundamental things. And that's going to shape your ethics. And ethics is going to shape your po politics. So... Religion and politics are joined at the hip, but the institutional church, my pastor, your pastor, uh, deacons, uh, you know, presbyters, they are not going to have political control over your life or my life. They're going to they're going to do their thing in the realm of the church. And as Jesus said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and render to God what is God's. And arguably, the religion clauses in the American Constitution parse uh, Christ's words exactly how I meant it. There is a realm of authority that God has given to the state, and there's a realm of authority, or to Caesar, and there's a realm of authority that properly belongs, belongs to God. But the Americans were clear, God's authority is higher uh, than Caesar's authority. 
And that's the key. One nation under God. Right. And so America, yeah. I think, got that right. Whereas Europe thought, well, yeah, God's over the state, but God needs to be meddling in the state. And that created all kinds of problems. So I, I, I've always found it fascinating that uh, the Protestant Reformation, its primary rebellion was against the overarching dominance of Rome in society, that Rome basically manipulated all of the um, political atmosphere and the countries of the Holy Roman Empire. And I, I just I just find it fascinating that once they broke away from Rome, the very first thing they, they did was they formed state churches, the Church of yeah. Germany, the Church of England. It's like they repeated the very mistake that they were actually rebelling against. And it's just, it, it's, you know, again, it's human nature that we see them run towards these errors. So it's just well, fascinating. I, I think the magistral Protestants just thought, well, we still need um, the church to superintend the state. We just don't want it filled with a Roman Catholic error. But if we have a Lutheran state or, a, a, you know, a, a Calvinist state or an Anglican state, that would be much better. But, of course, it wasn't. In the England, you had Calvinists and Anglicans and Congregationalists, and um, they were all warring with each other over who should control the state. Yeah. So... <clears throat> Okay, so let me ask you another question, though, and then we're going to get to today. Um, there was an Italian guy who kind of uh, threw his commentary in the ring, and he's, <laughs> I, I may be, this may be a whole other show that we do sometime, but the, a guy by the name of Machiavelli, mm. who, who, who um, writes to the king as to how to govern in a way that's effective, basically. And there's been a lot of debate about whether Machiavelli is talking about the way kings should run the country in, in order to be as effective. Basically, is he basically a pragmatist saying this is the way it should be run because this is how it, this is what works well? Or is he just saying this is just the way it is and it's, it, you know, people are evil and you have to do it? So, first of all, I'm not sure where you fall on that line. Was Machiavelli advocating for these principles or is he saying these are the only principles that work because these are the way people are? I don't, I don't know which way you fall on that. A lot of people really um, have a, a distaste for that. But I do know that. Uh, when you talk about Machiavellian uh, aspects or techniques or things like that, you're really talking about uh, using kind of pain and, or, or uh, uh, you know, kind of coerce, coercion, really, to get your way uh, in order to um, overcome some of these impetuses of the of the public what and what i'm yeah. the reason why i'm bringing this up is because machiavellian is the is the counter example to a, a virtuous society right it's a pragmatic society it's it's if you don't have virtue then then you're kind of in this nietzschean thing will to power and, and yeah. so and machiavelli i think is the perfect example of that yeah he's a precursor to that whole line of thought and yeah I, and there's still scholarly debates today about how to properly read machiavelli but what is clear is he uses the word virtue, but he redefines it. Virtue is redefined as cunning, being smart, uh, being able to like deceive your <laughs> um, uh, opponents. Like that's virtue for Machiavelli, right? And, and you read Machiavelli, he has some good like practical advice if you keep it within context. But I find it hard to read him without <clears throat> understanding. I don't see any kind of moral context uh guard railing his his advice here right and so i really think he has in his mind uh he was trying to kind of refound um modern politics in a way that disregarded um attachment to objective morality uh attachment to the good the true and the beautiful um and attachment to virtue as it had traditionally been understood and I think that, to me, that's the proper way to read him. But I respect, there's scholars I respect who say, no, 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 he, he was just a Republican. He realized that you need, he couldn't be so rooted in morality. And I, I, those arguments I've heard, but um, I, I tend to think that <clears throat> he was he was bad all the way down, not just at the surface. Yeah. But, but he, he's fun to read. And, <clears throat> he, you know, you'll find nuggets of advice here and there that are helpful. But as a system of thought, 
I mean, he was really pushing against the idea that you needed that a that there was virtue and that virtue should guide statesmen and virtue should guide citizens in in, in their political decision making. So I think he's uh, uh, um, someone to take uh, keep it. Uh, Take some advice where you can find it. Keep them at arm's leg, but don't embrace them fully. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting that I talk to a lot of people, and, and I don't know, in the modern era, there's there's so many business folks who say, like, they, you know, they look to the Godfather movies, yeah. for example, as their yeah. point of, of uh, yeah. advice and, and business acumen. And I'm like, you know, the... the the reason organized crime has the word crime in it, yeah. <laughs> it you know, it's, hey, did you watch the film? Did you see how right. everybody dies at the end? Do you, right. do you not understand that this is not a good way to go? I think right. that we're making a point. But that's we reinterpret these things. And, and kind of that's what brings me to my, my question. So where are we today? Where are we in 2024 with a Republican Party who has a presidential candidate? And that presidential candidate, wildly popular, and uh, from people who are secular conservatives, from people who are religious conservatives, some folks uh, have have so mm -hmm. been enamored by Trump, they say that, you know, he's God's chosen vessel, and they're, they're talking about anointings and things like that. At the same time, here's an individual who's ripped the pro-life plank out of the Republican platform that has been there for at least 30 years. And you got to say, well, what's going on here? Where are we today? Are we moving towards that pragmatic, that Machiavellian approach to in our politics? Is that where we're going? Uh, mm -hmm. Are we losing virtue? And as conservatives, don't we want to conserve virtue as much as we want to? Because if you don't conserve virtue, you won't conserve civilization. One, as you, you very well pointed out, it all falls downstream from that. So... How do we understand today's political climate and, and how do we talk with our friends and family members about, you know, first of all, what to do? Because a lot of folks are going to say, well, you know, what other choices are there? But more importantly, how do we try to um, bring virtue back into discussion? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot, a lot going on there. Let me just start with the, the concept of virtue. There's four cardinal virtues. There's prudence or practical wisdom. There's justice. Um, there's courage, and there's temperance or moderation. If you think of them as kind of four, uh, a Venn diagram of four circles interlocking, right? Um, <clears throat> so they're all overlapping. Um, prudence is an intellectual virtue. Prudence is applied wisdom. It's taking into account circumstance. It's taking into account a lot of uh, contingent factors, things that are in flux. And prudence is making the right decision for the right time in the right way, right? But prudence is ultimately rooted in principle, objective principle. But how you achieve that principle, you might take two steps forward, three steps back, four steps forward, right? That's prudential judgment. I would distinguish that from pragmatism. Pragmatism is um, not rooted in any North Star, any eternal principle. Pragmatism is just how do I get through the next day and how do I uh, make two steps forward and stay alive, right? Pragmatism has no principle, has no rooted in the objective moral order in the universe. I would say prudence by definition does. So prudence is an, an intellectual virtue, justice, um, is a moral virtue. We have to be just. We have to give others their due. Uh, we have to give God their due. We have to give our family their due. We have to give our country its due. Those are all elements of justice and just piety, right? And so that's just a courage. We have to have the will to, once we know what to do, and prudence is telling us what to do in this circumstance, um, courage gives us the wherewithal to actually do it. Right. And sometimes it's just persevering. Sometimes it's charging the, the machine gun nest. Right. Um, um, but justice and courage are moral virtues. They're the virtues of character. They've shaped us, whereas prudence is an intellectual virtue. It tells us how to act and where to act. And then all of that also is linked with temperance or moderation. 
justice has to be tempered by moderation, right? There's excess and there's a deficiency. There's a lack. You could have try for too much justice or utopia, but you could have not enough concern for justice. You could have too much courage, which is rashness. You could charge the machine gun uh, when you don't need to and, and lose your life. But it's also avoiding cowardice, right? It's moderating between these two extremes. And so those four virtues are all appeased. And in politics, kind of prudence is the, the key factor there. And so I just throw that out there in terms of where we are today. I think people don't even think in those terms when they mention virtue. They tend to think of um, just like good moral living. But uh, the classical virtues are, are really rooted in the history of the West, the Western tradition. And they're rooted in an objective morality that is rooted in God. And so if you're being prudent, seeking God, in the evangelical world, world we would call it discernment. So, really have so just just as a just as an example before before I I let you continue, I yeah. had a Christian philosopher friend who posted, I give me one um, cogent intellectual argument as to why a Christian should vote for Trump, and now we can disagree on whether uh, Trump fits this bill, but I would say, well, yeah, flip a foot, the trolley car problem. He, 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 this, I mean, aren't we? Isn't this what we are facing in the 2024 election? Do you a do something, take an active, you know, grasp of the handle, mm -hmm. and and steer the trolley car to hit the divert it, hit the one person, killing him instead of the five, or do you do nothing and allow the trolley car to hit five? Right. This is this is a classic ethics issue. And it's it's some people call it, you know, the, the the lesser of two evils kind of thing. But really, there is a, you, there is an ethical compunction on us to not be tacit if we think if we think that and you have to, again, give reasons for why voting for A or B is swaying the car to hit the one rather than the five. But. But I think there can be an argument that can be made. It's not that, and, and kind of prudence is is that aspect of it. Yeah, I would say that's where I think as Christians, we should be in agreement on our core theology. But within politics, politics involves prudential judgment, right? And different people can disagree on how to apply, how, where to give our vote, how to assess where we're at as a country, where we're going as a country, what will fix things. We can have different assessments of that, uh, and that might lead us to cast our vote in different ways, but it's in the realm of prudential judgment. People have a burden to make a prudential assessment of things, and so you could find someone who says, well, uh, Trump's a threat to democracy. He could install a tyranny. He might li not leave office, right? You could say, okay, yeah, I I'm I'm worried about that, actually, if, if if that happens, right? But we have a system designed to, uh, I mean, any president has constraints upon them, constitutional constraints, institutional constraints, executives can only do certain things, Congress can counteract them, the court can counteract them. So any would-be tyrant is going to have to throw off all of these institutional constraints put in place by our Constitution and the the history and tradition of our constitution. So I respect someone's like, nope, too much risk. I'm not going to vote for Trump. I'm going to sit out, right? Uh, but I can also respect someone's like, well, given where we're at, I'm going to vote for Trump. Um, and then you contrast that with, okay, well, what about, you know, Biden? He doesn't seem as a threat uh, of tyranny, right? Like, okay, fine. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't seem as tyrannical by nature in terms of like, just his personality and so forth, although some people debate that. But then you look at the history of the Democratic Party in the last 20, 30 years. They're seeking to loosen all of those constraints that I was just relying on to restrain Trump. Um, they've moved us from a, 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 a party system in terms of selecting candidates to a primary system. People like James Caesar said that is the, the, the old system used to constrain presidents yeah, more. They're seeking to loosen constitutional restraints. Um, they want to weave them out of the way whenever they're they're not. They they love the Constitution when it does what they want it to. When it doesn't, they're just like, no, it's 
it, it gets it gets yeah, in the, the way. The, yeah, the best example of this is is the, the people who are so worried about a monarchy, oligarchy, or or, or dictatorship are the same ones who say. Uh, the Second Amendment should no longer apply, which is exactly what the Second Amendment was. was if you ignore all of the uh, dictums of the Constitution and try to take over, then the citizen needs to be able to rise up in arms and throw out, overthrow you. So, yeah. So, I mean, citizens in the U.S., we have, we have a difficult decision coming up because do you go with the, <clears throat> the person and the party who've been trying to undo all the traditions and constraints on our constitutional system for 50 and 60 years, or do you go with someone who you think uh, might try to um, break out of those, but they want to keep them in place, those constraints, as far as we know, um, or do you just opt out and don't don't choose either? Um, but again, I would say that's a prudential judgment. That doesn't mean there's a... Prudence doesn't say there's not it doesn't doesn't say all judgments are equal. There's a right one, but it does allow for circumstantial assessments of, of where we are and what's going on. Uh, students often confuse that. Well, does prudence mean like everything's relative? No, 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 no. This is a right decision, but it depends on a lot of factors that are contingent on a lot of things, and so different good-meaning people could come to different assessments. But to assume that Trump's going to be over going to be able to overcome all the institutional constraints on a, on a would-be tyrant, you know, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you'd risk, uh, risk that as opposed to undoing all the constraints <clears throat> on a tyrant that maybe hasn't emerged or maybe, maybe, and then there's, then there's the whole issue of the, the bureaucracy or what's called the deep state. Are, are they already acting without constraints? Right, that's, right. that's a whole nother right. issue that, um, so I think there's a lot of factors going on, but that doesn't it doesn't lead one to say, oh well, Trump's the only threat to our constitutional system. Not necessarily. In fact, he's the one saying that he wants to keep it basically in place uh, the way it is or the way it has been. Um, so. Well, yeah, and you you mentioned courage, <laughs> and one of the things again that's missing in this conversation is. <clears throat> There's an assumption by both sides that the executive branch is in the driver's seat, that it's the executive branch that leads the country and shapes the nation. And that wasn't supposed to be the case. It was Congress. <laughs> this is the reason why your representatives are elected every two years, so that you can have immediate uh, feedback to your decision making. But Congress doesn't have courage. They've right. abdicated that role. They and that and Congress holds the purse strings for a reason because they can be the ones to say, stop, you yep. don't get any more money. Yep. And they won't do that. Congress should be the lead, not the, the executive branch. It's the legislature that's supposed to lead. Yes. And, and part of the difficulty of the entire modern political process is this, this broken faction here where we're, I mean, I remember the, the, the statement that Tip O'Neill made when he was talking to Reagan, you know, and they would have a disagreement on something. They have a disagreement on usually everything. Uh, but Reagan would go and do his press release and Tip O'Neill would go and do his press release. But then they'd go into the White House and they say, OK, then we close the doors and we hash out a compromise. We, can't, we don't do that anymore. We, in Congress, they're, they're so effete that it's only about running for election. And anything that might sway them against their base, they just kick down the road. And I'm not talking about one side or the other. I'm talking about both sides yeah. do this equally. There's yeah. just no courage in Congress anymore. The only one I can think of who, who did that was uh, uh, Senator um, Timney, uh, who was holding up all of the uh, uh, appointments for uh, admirals in the mm. Navy because mm. of the uh, because of the DEI issues yes, there. Yes, Alabama Senator um, Tim. Like on his name as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, th that's the kind of thing we need. And, you know, of course, it's easy now that they have these omnibus bills to kind of uh, duck and cover, uh, which I think is problematic as well. But again, they're, they're, Congress can fix those things. We're seeing this in Supreme Court decisions over and over again. The Supreme Court is going back to saying the, the law says that Congress has to pass the laws, right? The Constitution tells us that if you pass the law, then that becomes law. If you don't pass the law, you can't sue on behalf of it. You can't leave it oblique. You, Congress, you have to do your job. And, and the, the 
uh, voters are coming up in arms because they're saying the Supreme Court's changing things. No, they're not. They're just saying Congress do your job and Congress. And they're actually a number of these decisions are actually restoring old norms that were, have been <clears throat> torn down. Um, and uh, you know, I just saw just yes, I think it was last night. I read an article where Biden's talking about putting together a Supreme Court package of reforms to the Supreme Isn't Court. Isn't that scary? Yeah, <laughs> which harkens back to the FDR court packing plan. And I've told my students for years, you know, if if you ever get six justices, six conservative originalist justices, more or less, then you're going to start to see the attacks on the court from the left because they cannot sanction an institution in government that they don't control. And from 1936 or so, or 19, yeah, somewhere around there, all the way up until Trump's first turn, there had been a majority of liberal justices on the court, and the court had advanced um, <clears throat> a liberal agenda for 70, 80 years until Trump appointed three justices in his first term who actually uh, adhere to the original meaning of the Constitution in some form. There's there's shades within originalism and within textualism, but <clears throat> as you can see, they don't all vote together if you study it, but they all believe that the words should mean something. They can't just mean whatever you want them to mean. And <clears throat> they, the left cannot uh, stomach a, a court who actually interprets the words. They, they want... They think the court should act as the legislature. They think the president should act as the legislature. They think the legislature should act. They, they just think everything should be majority rule all the time, whatever people want, one moment to the next moment, constant whimsy from second to second. And our system was not designed that way. So they've been trying to deconstruct our system. And then they get worried about a would-be tyrant when the system was designed to prevent a would-be tyrant. So right. deconstructing the system that was designed to prevent what they're most worried about. It's incoherent. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Okay. So uh, as we're wrapping up our time, I just wanted to say, what, what do you think going forward? What's, uh, what's, the, what's the faithful Christian to do? What's the, how do we talk to our neighbors about this? How do we say, um, here's the path forward? We know that our, our political system is in a mess right now. We know that... There's a, a lot of animosity. We know that there's a lot of division even within us and our neighbors. But, but uh, there are certain things that we can do to, to, to move this forward. What would you recommend? I think um, in, in terms of a political decision making, so we've already established that render to Caesar what is Caesar's, render to God what is God's. And so in the realm of Caesar, in our system, we put our faith in laws, not men, which is to say we have built institutions there's there to preserve individual freedom. And so I would, as you're assessing the candidates, which candidate is going to preserve our system, which candidate is going to restore broken elements of our system um, <clears throat> and vote for that person, that, that those are prudential judgments. Um, I haven't met either candidate, although both Joe Biden did bump into me in Congress one time, but I didn't have a conversation with him. But that's a different story. Um, I haven't met them. I don't know them. Like, you know, when you meet someone, you can kind of like judge them. So we have to do this on the fly. Um, so system of laws and institutions, who's going to preserve those institutions and laws for us? Um, and so I don't think everything comes down to, I think morality should be a, a piece of it. I think it should be an important piece of it. For me, the pro-life issue is a huge one. And, you know, Trump, I think, dropped the ball on that recently. Um, but is he going to be better or worse on the issue than the Biden administration, who's let's have abortions up until the point of birth? No. So you're going to, we're going to have to make decisions on that. Um, but in general, Who's going to preserve institutions and political traditions that have sustained our country and our politics for 200 years? Um, I, I think our system is more robust than people give credit for. Uh, it has come through a devastating civil war. It has come through um, actual assassinations multiple times. Um, we have a pretty resilient system. 
I would just hate to see the system deconstructed to the point that it can't do what it was designed to do anymore. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Darren. Appreciate all of your time. Appreciate your thoughts. This is it's all fun. it's been. And like, yeah, it's great to great to talk about these things. And I think that uh, uh, as we get closer, maybe we'll have you on again and and kind of do a, do an overview as we get you know near I don't know October November something like that. So that would be good. good. All right, talk to you soon. Thanks, Lenny. All right. Thank you for watching this Come Reason video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to see more videos like these, consider subscribing to our Come Reason YouTube channel by clicking on the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. Lastly, if you'd like to help keep these kinds of videos free, consider providing a donation by clicking on the donation button beside me. Thank you.